All right, if you calculus lesson three or seven, analytic ana uh, 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 analytic ana analysis. Oh my God, I cannot speak. Um, F relative extremum, F minimum, F maximum. You know those definitions. Now we need to actually do it without a graph. All right, so today's date is Wednesday, October 21st, 2020. Um, our objective today, Chris, is to there it is. All right, so let's just do some examples. I think it's just one example on the front and then one on the back. Yep, just two examples. All right, that's it. And they're, they're kind of big, so here we go. Um, first step is always to do what, Fiona? Draw. Yeah, everyone draw out the x-axis. Let's do it. I'm gonna make mine black. Short. All right. I'll put some arrows. Yeah, that's fine. That was sanitized, so you're good. Um, Teflon, if you're watching this video, Fiona has stolen your spot. All right. Um, yes, um, I'll, I'll label that x too. It is our x-axis. So next step is to do what, Andrea? It is indeed to find the CVs. So we'll say we're finding FCVs. Um, the definition of FCVs again, Andrea, is or DNE. And just as a note, especially when we're talking about analytic analysis, F prime equals zero means I'm setting the top derivative equal to zero. And then DNE means I'm setting the bottom if I have some sort of fraction equal to zero, because we will eventually be seeing those, not yet, but just as a heads up. Um, okay, so that means I need to find f prime is equal to zero. Chris, help us out. We're in the log house. I see an ln there. Tell us, f prime of x, Chris, is? Uh, you're, you're taking the dinner, which is good. I need doubter first, the derivative of the outer. What's the derivative of a log house? It's one over whatever it is. So like you want to think of natural log, maybe turn the N into a slash. So it's one over whatever is in there. Oh, right, right. So uh, one over three X squared. And then what was dinner again, Chris? Six X, six X. Chris, keep going, reduce. Six divided by three. Two, X divided by X squared. X is on top or bottom, numerator, denominator. Bottom, yep, two over x, there it is. Oh, and lo and behold, the bottom, we do have a fraction here. So I, I can use the fact that I can set the top equal to zero and bottom equal to zero. So setting the top equal to zero, two equals zero, okay, that's kind of pointless. So uh, I, I can annotate exactly what's happening here. So when you're finding FCVs, um, when, the, when F prime is equal to zero, that really means I'm setting two equal to zero. And yeah, no answer. So you can say not applicable, can't do anything. When I'm saying f prime uh, dne, that means I'm trying to find where the denominator is equal to zero. And that's as simple as setting the denominator of x equal to zero. And we don't even have to do any math. We just say, okay, x is equal to zero. Okay, so we have one CV. It's at x equals zero. Let's label that up here in our graph. We can say right here at, I know we ran out of room there. That's the coordinate zero. That is a CV, the critical value. Okay, so um, we can come down here and label it as well. That's an FCV, that's at X is equal to zero. That's the information that we found so far. We have to find all of these things. So review from yesterday, increasing, decreasing. Fiona, help us out. What do we do? What's our next step? Yeah, do some test values. What do you want to test? Yeah, good values, negative one and one. Those are the easiest ones I can think of too. And we only care if it's positive or negative. We don't care about what number it is. Uh, you want to do negative one first. Plug in negative one into Chris's derivative two divided by x. It's a negative, I agree. So it's a negative over here, which means it's a... Oh yeah, and this next one is a positive. So when I have f prime is negative, that's the definition, Fiona, of f decreasing and obviously f increasing. All right. Uh, Andrea, help us with the intervals. So. Fiona says, everything to the left of zero is decreasing. Everything to the right of zero is increasing. Go for it, Andrea. Mm -hmm. Yep. And decreasing. 
Perfect. That was inequality notation. And I'm also making you responsible for um, interval notation as well. How do I say X is greater than zero in interval notation? Perfect. And then the other one is from, there we have it. All right. Um, I should probably be writing down the definitions of each of these. Um, let's kind of go rapid fire around the room. Um, Chris, FCV again is, the, um, what's the definition of FCV? F prime equals zero or F prime D and E. Fiona, F increasing. There it is. Andrea, F decreasing. Chris, relative extrema. There it is, F prime sign change. Fiona, F minimum. Negative to a positive. And Andrea, F maximum. Positive to a negative. And make sure that you are writing F prime over and over again because it's still the first derivative test. It's only F prime. Um, tomorrow we'll hit second derivative test, I believe. Let's see, 3 8. There it is, yeah. Concave up, concave down, inflection point. Those are F double prime. All right, so we have our definitions here. Let me move Mr. Sinel out of the way. You're in the way. Um, Chris told us F relative extrema is F prime sign change. So look at F prime. We had a negative sign over here on the left of zero. Then we changed to a positive sign over here on the right-hand side. So um, I forgot who I left off on. I think it's now Chris again, but I've been giving him the harder problems. Let's switch to Fiona. Fiona. The definition of F relative extrema is F prime sign change. Where do I have an F relative extrema on this graph up here? At zero. At zero, yep. And dang, I ran out of room. I wonder if I can, I'm gonna just grab everything and move it over. So, because I, I need to write more things in here. Wait for the computer to catch up. Hopefully I selected the right things and I can grab other things and move them elsewhere. <laughs> Put that back here, the top equals zero. Move that right there. I oh, forgot the other part of the equal to sign. I can grab that in a sec. Just want to rearrange the notes. I love having digital notes, by the way. Top is equal to zero. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to annotate the CV is also, maybe in a different color, let's do red. That's an F relative extrema. So let's come down here and label that. That's at x is equal to zero. And again, that was what we talked about in our a few lessons back, where in order to be relative extrema, you first have to be a CV. You have the potential of being a relative extrema at a critical value. You don't know if it's a saddle point, if it keeps going back up. And again, saddle point means you go something like that. This is a saddle point where it does have a, uh, a slope of zero, but then it goes back up. It could be one of those. It could be a CV and not a relative extrema, but typically it's going to be a relative extrema. Um, all right, then I need to find minimum and maximum. So Andrea, you're up first. F minimum and F, just do everything. Is, what is this thing? It's a relative extrema, so it has to be either a minimum or a maximum. Which is it? Yes, why? Exactly, yeah, we had a negative sign over here, then it turned into a positive, so I should have moved this down a little bit. All oh, right, underneath. this is an F minimum because it went from a negative to a positive. So F minimum happened at X is equal to zero and there are no maximums we can say not applicable for this problem. So those are the, the main things that you wanna be able to do. Um, but there's some other information that I should be talking about right now. And maybe I can print this out for you guys now. This is probably, I haven't done this before so I should do this now. Where is it? Calc course overview. Um, where are my log properties? Log properties, this thing. Um, have you all seen this yet already? Yes, no, maybe so. Command P, four copies. Um, so it's really important to know what the graph of natural log looks like, or of log, either of these graphs. Okay, I'm getting the wheel of death, there it goes. Um, let's read through these and I'm going to add just the graph to our notes. Um, so right now you guys are just paying attention. Don't have to write anything down. Um, you, you have questions about natural log of X. I'm just reading number one, um, but you don't have any questions about just L O G log base 10. So it's always L N of X. 
Uh, number two, here's the graph of natural log of X. And this is the thing we're gonna be adding to our notes. Notice that this X act, or the Y axis over here, it never actually touches it. It never crosses it. It just gets closer and closer to it. It's a vertical asymptote. Notice also that the graph of natural log of X, it has this X intercept always at one comma zero, which corresponds to when I do natural log, natural log of one, when one is the input, the output is zero. It's one of the properties that you need to know. Natural log of one is zero. Um, another property I'll talk about in a sec is later, but notice that there is no um, horizontal asymptote. There's no one of these. It goes up and up forever, just really, really slow. It takes forever to go up. Um, the way that I remember what a graph of a natural log looks like is this. I know what a graph of um, like e to the x looks like. e to the x is this blue graph right here. And it has uh, a y intercept of 0, 1. Because again, if I plug in 0 here, e to the power of 0 is 1. So I, I know what that graph looks like. I also know that it um, has a horizontal asymptote over here at 0 because you can never actually hit 0. The graph of e to the power of x and the graph of natural log of x are just inverses, which means I, I flip it over this line y is equal to x. If that helps you, then great. If it doesn't help you, then I can hopefully find something else that does help you. Um, so these are all the facts that I'm talking about right here. Um, if you have the graph of e of x, just reflect it over the line y equals x. And that's this graph up here. Uh, fact number two, it intersects the x-axis at 1 comma 0, super important. Uh, C, there are no negative x values. Everything on the left side over here is it doesn't exist. So if you are trying to plug in a negative value into natural log, it won't work. Um, D, all the y values um, in between 0 and 1. So I'm talking about this interval right here. All of these y values, all the heights are always negative between 0 and 1. And uh, the other side of that, everything above 1 is, uh, and all the x values above 1 um, has a y value that is positive. Uh, e, there are no horizontal asymptotes. It goes to infinity, so it does go up and up forever. Uh, and F, the domain is 0 to infinity, so it can never be 0. You can never plug in 0. If you try to plug in natural log of 0 on your calculator, it'll say error. You can't do that because you're trying to figure out what is the height that corresponds to this x coordinate. It never touches. So you can't do natural log of 0. It doesn't exist. So it needs to be a little parenthesis, not a square bracket. Uh, these general facts, especially these first three, you have to have memorized in your heart. Like you just need to know these in your bones. Natural log of zero does not exist. Natural log of one is zero. Natural log of E is one. That's one I haven't mentioned yet today. It's just one of those properties that you have to have memorized. Why? Because it's one of those properties that says uh, natural log is really saying log base E of something. So if I'm really saying log base E of E, what power does E need to be raised to to get to E? One. That's why natural log of E is one. Um, and then there's log rules that we can all remember. I think I've talked about these a little bit before, but um, especially for um, this rule C, this one comes up quite a bit. Um, so as an ex it just means that this P can move interchangeably in front or into the power inside the parentheses. So as an example, if you had a problem that looked like natural log of 25 minus natural log of five, uh, you can change this to natural log of five squared, the two can come down in front, and then I have two of those copies minus one of those copies, and I'm left with one of those copies. That's an operation that you should be comfortable with on the AP text. And if you don't know these things, I print it out, and you can review these things at your own leisure. This uh, worksheet is on the website. And there's some other properties too that uh, you will eventually need to know. I'll talk about those when I need to. Like, I think this is gonna be a property that we'll definitely need in unit six. So as I said, we are going to add these things to our notes. Uh, these are the notes. So I want to talk about the graph graph of natural log of x. You saw it. Let's see if you can recreate it now. So go ahead and make your graph now. So there's my graph. And I'll go ahead and pause. See how far you can get. Yep, so it looks like everyone has it. Um, it generally, the, there's two points that you have to have. The first point is um, this point at one comma zero. You have to have that point on your graph. The other point that's kind of nice to know is E. E is about 2.7, so about um, one, 2.7-ish. I have a height of one. So these two points right here, this is going to be E comma one. These two points need to be on your graph. 
And then you need to know that it never goes and touches this Y intercept. It gets closer and closer and closer to it. And that this function comes out like this. All right. So you can label that. That's Y equals natural log of X. Perfect. Label that our X axis or Y axis. Be a little bit more formal about it. And we're on to example number two. Flipping over. I'll leave this graph up here so we can copy it all down. All right. Example number two. Ooh, we have a fraction. Okay. Uh, first step, Andrea, go. Draw the x-axis. So everyone draw the x-axis. I'm going to draw it over here on the right. I realize I need more room than I have in the past. Do my arrows. Say, yeah, that's our x-axis. Um, Andrea, what do I do next? FCVs. FCVs. Um, definition of FCVs, Chris, is what? Or F prime um, D and E. And again, that means I'm setting the top equal to zero and the bottom equal to zero after I find the derivative. Okay, so that's the step that I'm working on. Let's give it a Fiona, take the derivative. You're correct that that is the derivative of the top, but because we have a uh, fraction, it's actually going to be a specific rule. It's not going to be a uh, product rule. It's going to be quotient. What is quotient rule? Just write down the, the highs and lows. Oh, you're going to go ahead and do it. Yeah, perfect. X plus one times two X minus three. Perfect. So that's low D high. I can label it. All that times one. X plus one quantity squared. This was high times D low. And this was all over low, low, low squared. Very nice. Can everyone do what Fiona did? Or do you have to write out the formula? No, from Chris, Andrea, can you do this? Or do you have to write out the formula? Okay, nice, we're, we're there. Okay, um, we need to simplify this. Um, let's give it to Andrea. <laughs> oh, okay, never mind. Let's give it to Chris. What? No, same with oh. the Andrea can do it after Chris. No. You got this, Chris. Yeah. Um, I'll help you out. So, foil, first, outer, inner, last. That's how you're going to multiply these two together. That's the fastest way of doing it. So first, so that means I'm doing x times 2x, and you get, Chris, 2x squared. That's first, outer is x times negative 3, negative 3x, negative 3x. Inner, 2x and 1, 2x. And last, negative 3 and 1, negative 3. OK, that was that first part. Um, I can just rewrite the x squared. Ooh, we have to be careful here, because really, Chris, uh, we are distributing that negative. So I have negative x squared. Distribute negative into x squared minus 3x. What's a negative times x squared is negative x squared. Negative times negative 3x is positive 3x. There it is. And as I've said before, over and over again, don't ever Foil out that bottom, just leave it x plus one squared. You never really need to do that. All right, now that Chris did the heavy lifting, Andrea, come in and uh, simplify the numerator. Yeah, plus three x. Oh wait, plus three x. Oh, sorry, no. So I, I misled you. So we have we have minus three x and plus three x. Those two canceled out, and I'm left with yep, plus two x minus three. 
perfect. And then the denominator down here is this x plus one quantity squared. And typically, you want to leave this in factored form. It makes your life easier. Just trust me. Factor this as much as possible. That numerator can be factored with a normal ninja star, which hopefully you can do in your head. But if not, I can do it off to the side. So off to the side, ninja star, what two numbers multiply to negative three and also add to positive two? Fiona. Three and negative one, there it is. So that means it's gonna be X positive three and X minus one. And this is all divided by X plus one quantity squared. So we're, we're done finding um, the derivative so I should come down here and say that this was really still still f prime that we were dealing with. This is kind of the, the final form of f prime. And I would like to make a note. I'll put a little asterisk up here. Always try to write in factored form. You'll see why in about um, 120 seconds. Not two minutes, 120 seconds, well, now 115 seconds. Okay, so um, we're still not done finding the CVs. Uh, Andrea, what are we doing next? We haven't even found the CVs. Like we, once we do CVs, then we can do test points on either side. Yeah, make what equal to zero? Say it again. Yeah, f prime is equal to zero. So that means, is it the top or bottom equal to zero for f prime equals zero? Top. top, yeah. So that means x plus three times x minus one is set equal to zero. And then I'm also doing f prime d and e, which means, Chris, I'm doing what equal to zero? I'm setting what equal to zero? Yep, x plus one squared. Precisely, all right, let's go ahead and solve. Uh, Fiona, can you solve x plus three times x plus x minus one equals zero? Okay, so we use the zero product property. We say that could be zero or that could be zero. So two equations that pop out of this. I mean, X plus three is equal to zero or X minus one is equal to zero. And then you said our answers are X is equal to three and one, there it is. Um, Andrea, solve this one for us, please. The X plus one quantity squared is equal to zero. X equals negative one, yep. And I'll, I'll write down the answer. I'll show how to get that too in case people can follow. Uh, you square root both sides to get X plus one is equal to plus or minus zero, which is silly, so I'm just gonna say zero. And then subtract one on both sides to get X is equal to negative one. So we have three critical values. We have negative one, one, and negative three. Graph them all on your X axis. Those are all of our CVs. Well, look at all the work that we did just to find the CV. That's crazy, right? So negative three, negative one, let's say right here, negative three, negative one and one. I don't care about scale. Don't scale this appropriately. Just mark them and label them. Those are CVs. I don't, I label them just in case I mistake them for my test points because that would be kind of embarrassing. All right, Chris, choose some test points for us. Negative one. Okay. Two, zero, and two. Okay. So again, Chris, you're plugging into the derivative that um, all of you worked on and that Fiona simplified for our, our factored form. You want to plug in negative four into this x, this x, and this x. And you're going to tell me what each of these one parts is. So when I plug in negative four into here, is this one um, binomial linear pair, is that um, a negative or a positive? It's a negative. What about this x minus one? When I plug in negative four into this x minus one, I get a 
negative. And then when I plug into, no matter what number I plug in, negative or positive, this bottom will always, always be Chris A positive. So I never have to worry about that bottom. This is the reason that I have you write it in factor form because it's much easier than plugging in into x squared times 2x and then minus 3, which might affect the negative or positive. It's very clear that a negative times a negative is a positive. So I think that was 120 seconds, maybe a little bit longer. We'll see. Um, we'll check the recording. So it's, it's a positive. So let's come back here and say this one was a positive. Um, let's do negative 2. Um, if you want to plug those in, negative 2, you get a what and what on the top. Positive and a negative, so that means we have a negative. Andrea, plug in zero. Negative, negative which is a negative. negative, exactly. And Chris, plug in two. Positive, and therefore it's a positive. Okay. Uh, if you want to go through these, F increasing or F decreasing for each of these intervals. There they are. And we should start labeling um, or like actually answering these questions. So F, C, V, we had three CVs. We had um, X is equal to uh, negative three, negative one, and one. All right, you guys all worked on increasing, decreasing together. Um, so let's give it to Andrea first. Just do uh, F increasing. Where's F increasing? Yeah, so negative infinity to negative three, negative infinity to negative three. And I do this little or symbol to combine it with Careful. So zero is a test point. Two. two is a test point. You have to go from a CV. Okay. Yeah, there it goes. So one to positive infinity. Perfect. Uh, can you also write that in inequality notation? Yep. And then combine that with. There it is. All right. Thank you. All right, Chris, I'm going to give you this one and I'll point out this is kind of a trick question. You have to be, it's not that much of a trick. You have to be careful about this. F is decreasing where? Negative three to negative one. Negative three to negative one. And what's the next one? negative one to one. Darn, you didn't fall from my trap. I was hoping you'd say from negative three to positive one. <laughs> no, but most people say that. I mean, I did for my first two years of teaching AP calculus. I thought that was fine to say negative three to one. Look, it's all decreasing. It's decreasing, 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 decreasing. So you should say, yeah, between negative three and one, it's decreasing. So that's, not right. that's not right, but who can tell me why? I can't just say because. Uh, Fiona, do more than because. Exactly. And if it equals zero, can it be dec uh, less than zero? Exactly. So, that, and that's a great analysis. So, uh, you're already smarter than I was two years ago. Um, yeah, good job. Um, and then, Chris, can you convert this uh, interval notation into inequality notation? Um, it's kind of tedious, but you got this. X, and then we'll do these less than less than symbols. Negative three, negative one. And then again, those inequality symbols. Negative one, one. Yeah, it's it's really gigantic to write that one out. So we typically don't do it. Um, F relative extrema. We're finally there. We should go ahead and define these three again, since those are the new ones for this lesson, right? Um, F relative extreme of Fiona is F prime sign change. Change. Uh, Andrea, F minimum. 
prime from a negative to a positive and Chris F maximum. Positive to a negative for F prime. There it is. All right. So back to Fiona. Relative extrema. Where does that happen? Where do I have a sign change? Yep. So I'll come down here. X is equal to negative three and one. And it's kind of cool to actually see what's happening here. I told you guys FCVs are where they can potentially happen. Yep. Negative three was a CV. Negative one was not a CV. And then one was or negative one was not a relative extrema and one was a relative extrema. So if I had to circle the ones that were relative extrema, it's two of the three, not every single one of them. Okay, so that means, Chris, that you have either negative three or one as a possible value for a minimum. Chris, tell me, where is there a minimum on our graph? It's either negative three or one or neither or both. Is it one? It is one. Why? Oh. Yeah, that, that's the definition. Yeah, it went from this negative to a positive on that CV. So I come down here and say X is equal to one. And then Fiona F maximum is at a. Negative three, it has to be right because Chris listed all the minimums and you can verify yep, at negative three, positive two. And we're done. So I want to show you guys a shortcut now, a shortcut. It's, it's not that much of a shortcut. It's more of a way to check your work and it does save you a bit of time if there's a multiple choice question on this. You can only have relative extremas when you have factors. This only happens, maybe I'll write this in red, happens when factors which is another reason to write everything in factored form when factors have odd powers. And I don't mean odd as in, oh, that's strange. It's strange that you had a hundred. I literally mean odd, like three, five, seven. Those are all odd numbers. And check it out, watch this. You guys all factored it into this form. I mean, Fiona did the final step. This had a power of one. This had a power of one. One and one are both odd, two is even. This critical value that pops out, we got negative one because you said equal to zero, right? The critical value that corresponds to this factored um, binomial is negative one. That is not gonna be a relative extrema because that has an even power. And come down here. We had negative one that corresponded to that negative one up here and negative one was not a relative extrema because it was an even power. So, and then I can do the reverse of that, the actual rule. These were both to the power of one, which is an odd power. And that means negative three and positive one, both are relative extremas. Negative three and one are relative extremas. So that's my shortcut. Relative extremas are when you have factors that have odd powers. More reasons to write it in fact and form. And there's another trick that like uh, applies to that too, which is, if I have a relative extrema, the definition of that is a sign change. Sign change means I flip from a positive to a negative. If I know from the very beginning, after, because we knew that these were odd powers from almost the very beginning, once we did a bunch of math, of course, but that was a very early step. Once I wrote down my CVs, once I found one of the signs and I know that that is definitely positive, I know that it's gonna to switch to a negative because this CV corresponds to a factor that had an odd power. I didn't even need to plug in negative two. I automatically knew that was going to be a negative number because it's a C or it's a relative extrema. Similarly, I know that that one is also going to be a negative. It's not going to change signs because this had an even power. This had an odd power. It is going to change signs. It makes the problem go much faster because you only need to plug in one number and then you can do everything else from there. It also means that you can verify that you got the right answers for your relative extremas. So that's the, the trick that I have for you guys. And that concludes the lesson. Let me get a fist of five for our objective today. Find where the function has relative extremas, minimums, and maximums without a graph. Four, four, three. All right, thank you guys.